Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. Just a few announcements before we um, begin our service. Uh, just to say, obviously, it's very, very full in here, and there's still actually quite a few people missing. Um, so it's getting to a point now where in here it's just not doable with the amount of people. So next week we are going to be having our service in the community centre and for the foreseeable future on Sundays it will be in the community centre. So we'll have a bit more space and we, uh, yes, indeed, I, am very, I want to applaud that too. And comfy chairs, Gloria. So... <laughs> um, so, yeah, so hopefully that, that seems to all be okay. Um, we've just got one or two things to confirm. Um, but next week, the plan is that we're going to have the service through in the community centre and it'll be a bit more space and a bit more room to breathe. Um, so that'll be good. Um, so that's next week. Um, Luke's very, he's thrilled about that. Uh, also, also to say, uh, this Wednesday is house group. So house groups are on this Wednesday. If you're not in a house group, it's a Bible study in a house. If you would like to be in that, uh, it's just a great opportunity to have a kind of more informal discussion about the um, book of the Bible. We've been looking through Psalms together. Um, if you would like to be part of that, speak to me um, or speak to Phil, speak to Tim, and we'll get you plugged into uh, a house group. That's this Wednesday. And then the big thing, which we're going to start flagging up quite often now, is this, Jungle Explorers. Uh, that's our holiday club on the 1st to the 4th of July. That's for everyone in primary 1 to 7. Uh, we've got a group of um, eight Americans coming over from Florida to come and help out with this. So, ooh, yeah. So, uh, international, exotic. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Um, if, if you could uh, just pray about this. If you know anyone who's primary aged, um, please do encourage them to come along to this. It will be for, yeah, 1st to the 4th of July. It's a week of uh, games and crafts and Bible talks and drama, and it's always a great fun, and um, the kids love it. So uh, that is the 1st to 4th of July. Just get that in your diary. And there's loads of flyers. If you want to take flyers, drop them off at school or just anywhere, um, please do take them. That's Jungle Explorers. Um, and if you'd like to help out in any way with that, again, just speak to me. And um, yeah, the more the merrier in terms of help. We're going to transform this room into a jungle scene. So it'll look amazing. Um, so uh, let's make a start. I'm going to read some words to us from Psalm 130 to lead us into a time of worship. And then we're going to sing that whole psalm. Uh, psalm 130, verse 5, says this. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord, more than the watchmen wait for the morning, more than the watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all of their sins. We come to worship God. We worship a God who redeems, who forgives us of all our sins. No matter what we have done, um, in Christ all is forgiven. And as we sing this psalm, we are reminding ourselves of that great truth. So let's stand together and we're going to sing from the depths of war, Psalm 130. From the depths of woe I raise to thee the voice of lament Thank you. 
Do have a seat, and as we begin this service, we're going to come to God in prayer and pray as we do every week for a different nation and a different church that we are connected with. Uh, and this week, we're going to pray for the nation of Guinea in East Africa. Uh, around 14 million people live in Guinea, about 0.7 percent of the population would be uh, evangelical Christians. Um, it is a nation that has undergone great political turmoil in recent years. There was a, a coup there, and the president was ousted by the military. Um, currently, the Christian minority and the missionary community have the freedom still to share the blessed hope of Christ uh, to a nation that has been long plagued by poverty, corruption, and uncertainty. And we pray that they will seize this opportunity with confidence and faith and that the people of Guinea would know the hope of the gospel. Uh, we're also going to pray for uh, new pastors. Guinea has three Bible schools for the entire country, which isn't a lot. And we want to pray for more. We want to pray for the training up of new leaders and missionaries and uh, gospel workers. Um, and despite increased missionary activity, most people remain a pioneer challenge. We want to pray um, for the gospel to go out. It's a predominantly Muslim country mixed in with various different uh, animistic tribal beliefs and so we pray that the gospel of Jesus Christ would set people free uh, from all their sin and sorrow as we just sang. We're going to pray for Guinea. We're also going to pray for uh, Garabost Free Church. So Guinea and Garabost, they don't often feature together. Um, Garabost is uh, on the Isle of Lewis, isn't it, Chris Minor? Whereabouts on the Isle of Lewis? Point. Just outside Stornoway. Just outside Stornoway. So there we go. On the sacred isle. 
Um, so <laughs> it's on the Isle of Lewis, Garabos Free Church. Uh, we're going to pray for them. We'll pray that um, uh, they've asked us to uh, pray for wisdom. They have two buildings. Garabos Free Church was two congregations that came together, and now they're trying to uh, just figure a way to use their resources wisely, and so we'll pray that they will have wisdom uh, in how to do that. We want to give thanks uh, for the number of parents who come to church and bring their children to Sunday school. We want to pray for the young people in that church, and they have asked that um, we pray that God would send more families that, and that they would be led to make a commitment to Jesus. And we'll pray for them as they seek to share the good news of Jesus uh, in that part of um, Lewis. So uh, let's begin by praying. We'll pray for both these things together. Father God, we are so often conscious that we're, we're sinful people. We've messed up in so many different ways. And Father, as we gather to worship you this morning as your church, we want to begin with a confession to you collectively as your church. We confess that we are sinners. We confess that we haven't lived, we haven't loved the way that we should. We confess that there are so many things that we have said and done and thought that are against you. And Father, we hold no illusions. We're not here to pretend. We know that we're messed up. And we know that we need your forgiveness desperately this morning. And so as your church, we bring our sin to you, almighty God of all creation. But we know that we bring our sin to the God who is rich in mercy, abounding in love, to the God who hears our cry and forgives all our transgressions. We know that we bring our sin to the one whose love is unfailing, to the one who will redeem us from all of our wrongdoings. Father, we know that that's true, just as we sang, because we have seen in Jesus Christ how you have taken all our wrong, and Jesus, how you have suffered for it in our place, so that we could be free from condemnation, so we can sing as your children, and so, Father, as we do confess our sin, we also want to acknowledge that that sin is gone, that we have been pardoned, and we have been adopted into your family as your children, and now we have your Holy Spirit, and we celebrate that gospel transformation this morning, that you would take us out of the darkness, bring us into the light, that you would take us out of the, the depths of our woe and sin and bring us into the light of life and forgiveness and joy with you forever. Father, we thank you for that wonderful gospel that has changed everything about us. We pray, Lord, that that gospel would go out in this scheme here in Dundee and would it go out all across the world to all nations. And Lord, we really want to pray this morning, particularly for the nation of Guinea in East Africa. Father, a nation that has been plagued by poverty, corruption, uncertainty, violence. Lord, we pray and ask that in difficult and hard times, the hope of the gospel of forgiveness that can only come through Jesus Christ would spread through that nation. Father, we thank you for the three Bible schools that are there. But we pray and ask, Almighty God, would you raise up many more? Would you raise up many laborers for that bountiful harvest field? 14 million souls made in your image. Lord, we know that you desire that none should perish, but that all should come in repentance and faith in Christ. And so would you, Almighty God, raise up a great movement of your church in the nation of Guinea. Father, there are many people there who don't know Jesus. And Father, we pray for the small church that is there. We pray for courage and boldness for those who follow Christ. We pray for a sense of knowledge of your presence with those who feel isolated because of their faith. Father, please would there be a major breakthrough of your spirit in that nation, we pray. Lord, closer to home, we want to pray for our own nation, 
We want to pray for Garabost Free Church on the Isle of Lewis. And Father, we thank you for the parents who come to that church, for the children who go to that Sunday school. Lord, we pray that through the witness and discipleship of that church, you would raise up a generation of people who would be faithful to you, who would be bold and unashamed to proclaim Christ. And Father, we pray that the, the witness of that church, particularly amongst families and young people, would spread throughout the community there and would many come to know Jesus through that witness. Father, we pray that you would give them wisdom and advice on how they can make the best use of their resources and would the congregation remain united together as one in all the decisions that they have to make. Father, use that church for the glory of your name and the spread of your kingdom. And Father, we pray for ourselves here in Charleston as we come to study your word. We pray and ask Almighty God that we would see Jesus. We pray, Holy Spirit, would you give us understanding and insight? Would you challenge us and comfort us? And would we just be very conscious that this morning we are hearing the voice of the Lord? It's in his name we pray. Amen. Okay, folks, um, if you have a Bible, please could you open it up to Romans chapter 8, which is on page uh, 1134. We're actually going to start Romans chapter 7, verse 18, just leading us into chapter 8. Um, 1134, if you've got one of the Bibles, if you've got a Bible with a um, mountainscape on the front of it, then it's actually page 850, but for every other Bible... Um, it is 1134, um, Romans chapter 8. Here's where we're going to be for the next five weeks. We are going to do a series in which we are just looking at one chapter in the Bible, this chapter, uh, Romans chapter 8. This is, are you allowed to have favorite chapters? Yeah. Okay. Just for the day. This is, in my opinion, and I'm, I'm really not exaggerating, this is the greatest chapter in the entire Bible. And the stuff that is written here, if you get this, if you get this, it will affect your life in every way possible. The old uh, Puritan preachers, that is the preachers from the... Uh, 1600s, they used to call Romans 8 the Great Eight um, because they too considered it, many of them considered it one of the greatest, I guess, greatest things that has ever been written, um, Romans chapter 8. So let me just give a bit of context um, before we dive in and read it. Um, Romans chapter 8, we're, we're coming right in the middle of a letter. It's a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome. And in chapter 15, you, you, he explains why he wrote the letter. Um, two reasons. Firstly, he's about to go on a missionary trip, trip to Spain, and he wants this church to get behind him. He wants them to get behind the idea of mission going out to the world. But the second reason he wrote this letter is that in the church itself, there's a bit of infighting going on, and particularly between two groups, the, the Jewish Christians and the non-Jewish Christians, the, the Gentile Christians they seem to be having some kind of conflict. And so how does Paul get a church to get behind mission and stay united together? Well, he tells them the gospel. That is the good news of Jesus. And so that's how he begins. In chapters 1 through 4 of this letter, he explains to this church, look, we have all fallen short of God's standard, but through Jesus we can all be forgiven and made righteous. And he said to this church, look, that is something that you cannot earn. That is a gift that is received through faith. And then in chapters 5 through 8 of Romans, Paul talks about, well, what does it look like to live in light of this gospel? As someone who has been made righteous by God, how should we live? And here in chapter 8, this great chapter, there is one big thing that he's wanting to push, and it's this. The gospel gives the Christian assurance. That's what this is all about. This whole chapter is about assurance. 
Paul wants this church to know that when you follow Jesus, you can be 100% sure that you are completely and utterly safe, no matter what life throws at you. And we need to know that. Because in this chapter, he's going to pick up on two threats that you will face in your life if you come to follow Jesus. Two threats that will make you doubt whether or not you are a Christian. Do you know what they are? They both begin with S. Sin and suffering. So if, if God has said that I'm righteous, if he saved me from my sin, why is it that I keep on sinning? Now, as a minister, as a Christian... I know that's a question that everyone I've spoken to has at some point. Why do I keep doing this? And the other question they have is this. Well, if God has saved me, if God has declared me righteous, if God has rescued me from all my sin, why has he let me go through such hard times and suffering? Again, another common question. Both those questions, sin and suffering, are going to be dealt with in this chapter. The battle on the inside... That's the battle of their sin and the battle on the outside, the battle of living in a broken world subject to suffering and death. How can we know we are safe in God's love when that is what we experience? Well, Romans 8 is here to help us. And Paul would say there is one thing we must remember when you face these battles. You must remember God's Holy Spirit at work in you. See, when someone comes to follow Jesus, God doesn't just forgive them. He changes them from the inside out. And he is with them by his Holy Spirit. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it's the Spirit of God that is at work in a believer's life that gives them assurance when they struggle with sin and suffering. So I've got, had an outline, I think it's gone somewhere now, of kind of what we're looking at in the next five weeks Uh, We're going to see that with God's spirit, you are free, you can fight, you have a father, you have a future, you have a hope no one can take from you, and you have a love that you will not lose. That's the things that we're going to see over the next few weeks. And I'm hoping that it will assure us so that we are driven to mission and we see the importance of unity together. So let's look at how it begins. Romans 7 verse 18. We're going... So I'm distracted by Spider-Man running in front of me there. <laughs> uh, Romans 7 verse 18. Um, we're going to talk about sin today, the battle within. And here you can see Paul is talking about his struggle with his sin. Have a look at it. Romans 7 verse 18. It's in the middle of the paragraph. This is Paul writing. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but it's the sin living in me that does it. And so I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I I myself in my mind... I'm a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives you life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Amen. 
This is God's word. We will look at that. Um, there are bits there that will be confusing, but it is wonderful. Uh, we're going to sing a hymn just before we do look at that. It's my favorite hymn of all time, so no pressure, Simon. Um, <laughs> sang it at my wedding, sang it at my daughter's baptism. Um, the hymn's called And Can It Be. It's about the, um, Charles Wesley who wrote this. It's a description of what it is to be a Christian and the freedom that comes in Christ. And he wrote this hymn based upon Romans 8, verse 1. So let's stand together. If you don't know the tune, you'll pick it up. And we'll sing And Can It Be. Can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me, caused his pain for me, who him to death pursued. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? His Father's throne above, so free, O oh, infinite, His grace emptied Himself of all but love, and bled for Adam's helpless race, tis mercy all and free for all oh my God it found out me amazing love how can it be that my God no Another verse. Okay, so I ruined it for you. Sorry. <laughs> Not at all. Lovely.
People are saying I put too much pressure on you there, no. Simon. <laughs> it's lovely. Beautiful words. Um, well performed as well. Leslie would be proud. <laughs> Get your Bibles open, please, to that bit that we read that inspired that hymn. Uh, and the, the hymn that we're going to sing afterwards as well, again, based on Romans 8. So influential is this chapter to many people's lives. Um, I'm going to read to you words from a famous speech. It's not from uh, Romans, uh, but see if you can tell me who said it, okay? From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And when this happens, when we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, We will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. That's it. You can do well on the quiz. Martin Luther King. I'm going to shoot my nail uh, no, it was Martin Luther King. <laughs> Everyone else was right. I must have been getting there. Did you? <laughs> on, on the same wavelength, yeah. same movement uh, in many ways. Yeah. It was, uh, that was the speech that Martin Luther King gave. A um, famous speech that was part of the American Civil Rights Movement. And what makes that speech so great and so engaging is the passion with which he spoke it. He knew the joy that would come when African Americans would be treated as equals, when they would be free from their oppression at that time. You know, freedom is a great thing. Freedom inspires speeches. Could have done that one, or I could have done the Braveheart one, but I thought I'd go for that one instead. And I guess today, as we look at um, this part of Romans 8, I want us to have that feeling of joy and relief that being free gives you. I want us to see today that if you're a follower of Jesus, there is a sense in which you can say, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, I want to say that this is what Christ is offering. Freedom. People think Christianity is about coming under a set of rules to obey, to earn God's favor. You could not be further from the truth. And Paul will say, no, that is not what Christianity is. This is about having freedom. A freedom that you can have even if you are in chains. A freedom that you can have if you're in the jail. A freedom that you can have if everyone is set against you and you lose everything in your life. Because this is not a freedom from the oppression of others. What Paul is speaking of that we celebrate is a freedom from the consequence of all our sin and wrongdoing. Jesus has paid for all of it. And I want us to see today how amazing that is. Because there will be many who do follow Jesus and they know that in their heads. But the reality is in their life they feel completely trapped. They feel wearied by the fact that they keep doing stuff that is wrong. And it's a struggle. And if we look at ourselves, well, sometimes it can be despairing. But what this passage of Scripture will do, uh, this is often what we talk about, is it will take this gaze that is so often carved in on ourselves and it will lift our head up to see God and what he has done for us through Jesus. So there's two things we're just going to see today. Two very simple points. Firstly, we're going to talk about the struggle. The struggle with what Paul calls the law of sin and death. And then secondly, we're going to see the freedom. The freedom that comes through the Spirit of God. So, firstly, as we look at this, let's talk about the struggle against the law of sin. You know, I want us to read that little bit of Romans 7 because it will help us understand the wonder of chapter 8. And you can see, looking at the end of this chapter, Paul's describing his struggle. 
Look at what we read in verse 18. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but it's the sin living in me that does it. It's the do-do passage. Probably shouldn't call it that. But do you hear what he's saying there? Now, now bear in mind, who, who's writing this? Paul. Number one missionary. If there's one Christian I would want to be like, it's the Apostle Paul. And here he is speaking of his struggle as a Christian. Paul, the great apostle, he's saying, look, I've got this struggle within me. I know I'm a sinner. I was born with this sinful nature. But Jesus has saved me. But now there's this war inside of me. I want to do good. That is, I, I want to honor God. I want to do that. But I find that so often I don't do that in my life. And there are these sins that I used to indulge. But, but now as a Christian, I, I hate these sins. I don't want to do them. But I find that they often creep back in. And I'm doing the very things that I don't want to do. Some of you and many folks around here know the pain of addiction come in many forms. Gambling, drugs, alcohol. What we've just read, I guarantee if you've ever struggled through addiction, that resonates. That feels like the struggle of an addict. But even if you have never bought a coupon or smoked a joint or drank a beer, if you're a follower of Jesus, this is the struggle we all feel. It's like we're addicted to the sin that we hate. You mean, you might think to yourself, why, why can I be so selfish as a person sometimes? I don't want to be. Why, did I, why do I keep gossiping? I'm careless with my speech. Why did I say that? <laughs> Many times I have laid, this, this often comes to my mind, either in the shower or at nighttime when you're lying in bed. Why did I do that? <coughs> Why is it that I can get so easily lured in by, by greed or, or sexual temptation or a desire to have everyone think well of me and in my mind, my imagination takes me to places that it shouldn't or I do things or I say things that I know I shouldn't be doing or saying. Why is it that I can be so mean and, and so cold-hearted and so unloving and so callous to people? And above all, I despair that I can be so unloving towards the God who I know gave up everything to get me. I want to honor him. I know he is better than everything else. I know that sin's a lie, it's false. And I want Jesus, but I'm doing wrong. And I just sometimes feel, when I look at myself, I don't even understand myself. Friends, have you ever felt that? Well, Paul has. And he says here that he feels that there's a war inside of him between two laws. There is God's law, God's way to live, summed up in God's word. And, and I guess when Paul's talking about this here, he's, he's talking specifically about Old Testament law summed up in the Ten Commandments. The law given to Moses. Paul knows that law is good. He longs to live by that law. But here's the thing. God gave his people, God gave Israel a law not to say, hey, you better keep all these rules in order for me to accept you. No. Earlier in Romans 7, Paul said that one of the reasons God gave his people a law was to show them they can't keep the rules. Yes, this is how you should live, but look how far you have fallen of my standards. You see, the law of God, what it does is it illuminates our sinful nature. It doesn't save us from our sin. Every other religion in the world, this is so key here. This is what marks Christianity as different. Every other in the religion in the world has a law that you have to keep in order for God to accept you. Christianity is much more realistic. God's perfect law cannot be kept. It exposes. Think of it like this. Here's the illustration. God's law is like switching on the light in a dirty basement. It doesn't clean up the mess. It shows you the mess. 
The law shows the mess of my heart. And Paul's saying, I long, I long to obey God. I long to obey that law. But I have this other law at work inside of me. Not the written law, but the law he calls the law of sin and death. And you can see in verse 23 there, he describes it as waging a war inside of him. He's saying, I want to honor God, but I find myself sinning. It's like he's saying, you know, I wish I could just push a button that would stop me from sinning and just make me perfectly obedient and loving towards God. I wish I could do that. Do you ever feel that? Can I say, if you feel that, that is a very good sign that God's Spirit is at work in your life. Because you cannot hate sin and desire Christ without the Spirit of God changing you. Before you were a Christian, well, you didn't care. Now you do. It's not that you didn't care about doing wrong, it's that you didn't care about offending God because he was largely irrelevant. But now when you come to follow Jesus, you're starting to resist sin. And it's only when you really start to resist something that you feel its power. When you move against a strong wind, you know its power before you just let it blow you over. When you swim against the current, you feel its power before you just kind of let it sweep you away and not caring where it took you. Before you knew Jesus, you didn't care about the offense you did to God. Now you do. And you want to resist it but it sometimes feels like you're not moving forward at all. And Paul feels the struggle. He feels the battle. He feels the war. I keep doing wrong. Why do I do it? Why am I like this? And it crescendos with this cry in verse 24. What a wretched man I am. That's true. If you think today, I'm a good person, God should be impressed with me and God should like me. I would have to say in regards to the Bible, you probably don't know the God of the Bible and maybe you don't know yourself. We think we're good because we often set our standard as to what good is. It's always one that we pass, no matter who you speak to. It's always one you pass. But if we see God, if we see his law, if we see his perfection, his goodness, we realize something very quickly when you see that. I am not good. What a wretched man I am. Uh, A lot of you know that I do chaplaincy work with the boys at Lockheed United. Um, Came third this this season, but next season, Highland League, I can feel it. Now, I, I go to training with them. Uh, Most of the time, I just kind of stand at the sidelines like a spare tube and I get the ball whenever they kick it out. That's about the extent of my footballing skills. Uh, But I watch them training. And I watch them and these lads are good footballers. Like, they're good. I'm watching them and I I always find it really interesting. Uh, Some of them know that they're good footballers. But see if you took one of these lads and they played in a match with someone like Messi. They, they probably would never play football again and they would quickly realize something. They're not that good. They've fallen short of the better standard. Do you know the Apostle Peter, when he first encountered Jesus, Jesus did this great miracle. Peter saw the perfection of the Son of God and he didn't go up to Jesus and say, whoa, that was amazing. In Luke chapter 5, we're told what he did when he met Jesus. He saw him, he saw his perfection, and Peter fell down at his feet and said, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And Jesus didn't say, No, Peter, you're not, you're great. No, no, Peter's right. But nor did Jesus depart from him. He said to him, Don't be afraid. I may have wretched behavior, but folks, Jesus came for the wretched. He came for the sinners. He came for the sick. And it's so important to realize that. It's important that you don't stop halfway through Romans 7 verse 24. Because look, some of you have stopped there. You're fighting sin. You're resisting 
the wind. You're swimming against the, the tide, but you're trying to do it all by yourself. And it's no use. It's no use trying to psych yourself up saying, no, no, this time, this time, I'm going to be better. I'm going to be better. You live that way, you will be crushed. That's living under law, not spirit. And so far in this part in Romans 7, apart from the do's, what's the words that Paul has been repeating? I, 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 me, me, me. And he's saying that because he's saying, look, when I keep looking at myself and my obedience to God's law, utter failure, wretched man. But that's not where he ends. No, he goes on, doesn't he, in verse 24? Who will rescue me? From this body that is subject to death, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. I am a wretch, but God has delivered me through Christ. The sin in my body, this body that is subject to decay, has been delivered by Jesus. And as we'll see in a few weeks, I am a son now, a daughter of God. And so my acceptance as a Christian before God is not based on my performance or how well I'm doing in the fight against my sin. My acceptance before God is based on the finished and complete deliverance of Jesus, my Lord. This, yes, there is a war. But really all throughout Romans chapters 5 through 7, Paul has been showing this church, look, grace will triumph over sin every time. The struggle is there, but the believer has victory because we have been delivered through Jesus. And now in chapter 8, he wants to elaborate on that by talking not about the law that exposes our sin, but the Spirit who sets us free from it. That's the second point, the freedom that is given by the Spirit. You know, 724, what a wretch that I am, is building up the tension. And um, Paul's a very emotive writer. He's building up the tension. What a wretch that I am. There's just this, this cry of anguish and, and it's like the chains were beginning to tighten but now in chapter 8 they burst. It's like Paul was sinking but he's pulled out of the water for a huge breath of air in Romans chapter 8. Yes I struggle he says but Jesus delivers me And Paul has been saying since chapter 5 that the Christian is someone who has received the gift of Christ's righteousness. And so the struggle does not get the final word. And that's why he begins chapter 8 verse 1 by saying, Therefore, in light of all I've said for the past few chapters, this is what you need to hear, church in Rome, church of Christ. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If we could only get the weight of that verse. Do you know there was an old school preacher called Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, and by the way, he preached through Romans and it took him 13 years. So 13 weeks in Ezekiel ain't bad. eh? Anyway, he said this about Romans 8 verse 1. This is what Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said. This is one of the greatest statements of the scripture, one of the most important for Christian experience and for the health and well-being of the Christian believer. Most of our troubles are due to our failure to realize the truth of this verse. Now that's quite a statement. Most of your trouble as a Christian will be due to the failure to understand Romans 8 verse 1. I think he's right. And I want to talk through how this affects us practically. But I first of all want us to consider verse 2 to 3 and try and understand this. Because it's here Paul explains how the Christian can say there's no condemnation for them. That's a bold statement. No matter what you've done, no matter who you are, no matter anything that's in your past, if you're in Jesus, you can say, I am not condemned. That's a very bold statement for anyone to say. How can he say that? Well, verse 2 to 3 explain, um, but it's, <laughs> it's quite hard to get your head around. Uh, Romans 8 is like digging for buried treasure. Paul has condensed some of the most amazing truths you will ever read, but they are loaded in sentences that are difficult to understand. And by the way, if you find them hard, just, just take heart. The Apostle Peter 
said that he found Paul really hard to read. So the Apostle Peter, who actually spent time with Jesus, said he struggled to understand a lot of what Paul says. But if you dig, there is treasure. And Romans 8 forces you to slow down, to think and meditate, because this is such a soothing balm of assurance that you will need. What's he saying? In verse 1, those in Christ, that is Christians. Now, that's very important. The only people who can say this are those who genuinely follow Jesus. In Christ, you are not condemned. Even though you have this war with sin. Why are we not condemned? Because verse 2, through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. So that law in us that we struggle with, the law of sin and death, that failure to keep God's standards, well, it seems hopeless. It's it's like a lead weight that is pulling us down under the waves, leading us down to death. You try being a good person. You try living under law, thinking you could earn God's favor. You are bound. You are tied. You're enslaved. You will head to death. You can't do it. But when you come to follow Jesus, he forgives all of your wrong and he gives you his Holy Spirit and you become united to Christ. So verse 2 should read, because in Christ, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free. You are in Christ as a Christian. You are bound to him by the Spirit. And therefore, the lead weight of the consequence of your sin has been cut free. You are out of the water. You're united to Jesus. You're free because everything that Jesus did has now become yours. And what did Jesus do for you? Well, he achieved your freedom from condemnation. So verse 3, let's keep digging. Verse 3, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did. God's law, Ten Commandments, that cannot save you. Keeping that law, you can't do it. Can't save you from condemnation. Remember, it lights up the dirty basement. It doesn't clean it. That law exposed our sin. Our sinful flesh weakened it. But what that law could not do, God did. How? By sending Jesus, his son. Listen to the careful language of verse 3. In the likeness of sinful flesh. And so, not as a sinner, in the likeness of sinful flesh. So Jesus came as a human being to do what the law could not do. He came in our likeness. Why? Let's keep digging. What does it say? He says here, to be a sin offering. Now, stop. What does that mean? We need to be saved. We can't do it. We can't obey the law. But God can do it. How? By sending his son like one of us to be a sin offering. What does that mean? Well, We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Remember Ezekiel? We talked about uh, before Jesus in the Old Testament, when when you went to worship God at the temple, what you had to do was you had to take an animal with you for your sacrifice. And you don't get too attached to that animal because it's about to die. Uh, And this sacrifice was to be the sin offering. That's what it was called. Symbolically, little Fluffy the lamb would be killed to show you that your sin needs to be punished if you are to be forgiven and come near God. But these sacrifices could never actually forgive sins. They were pictures to point us forward to Jesus. And he came to be the sacrifice once and for all. He came to be the sin offering. And when he died on that cross, he takes your sin and he is punished for it in your place. You are not condemned as a Christian because that sin has already been condemned by Jesus. That's what the rest of verse 3 says. That as a sin offering, he condemned sin in the flesh. Yes, the wrong that we do deserves to be condemned. You better believe it deserves to be condemned, that wrong. But Christian, it has been condemned. Let me explain it like this. I love a wee diagram. Uh, As I've mentioned before many times, my first degree before I did theology was animation. And people here have just been blown away 
the way I've used this animation degree. Uh, let, let me try and explain verse 3 here in, in diagram form. Um, there we go. There's, there's me. Me and my sinful flesh. Sin is in me. It's there. It's been there since I was born. As a result, I am under God's condemnation. I cannot remove it. I cannot obey the law. I cannot get rid of it. It's there. It's in me. But there is Jesus. He is righteous in the likeness of sinful flesh. He is not condemned. But when he died on the cross, it was like a swap happened. You see on the cross, here's the animation degree. I give Jesus all my sin, not just the stuff I've done in the past, but the present and the future as well, has all gone unto Christ. And Jesus gives me his perfect life that I couldn't live. So my sin's gone and Jesus, his righteousness has gone on me and therefore the condemnation I deserve has gone on Jesus. And the status he enjoys comes on me. Not condemned. It is impossible for you as a Christian to ever be condemned for your sin. It is completely and utterly impossible. Do you have faith in Christ? If you do, my brother and sister, you can say with all confidence today, I'm not condemned. Your sin has been condemned, but on the cross. And you will never be condemned for it because he was condemned for it in your place. In other words, you're free. The old hymn puts it well. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just was satisfied to look on him and pardon me. Now, let me just close by applying this practically. Martin Lloyd-Jones was right. Most of our troubles as a follower of Jesus are due to our failures to understand Romans 8 verse 1. Here's the first big application to take from this. You must not despair in your struggle with sin. Are you exhausted and losing hope in the war? Wretched man, wretched woman that I am, if that's where you are, but you've got no further than that, then you've lost sight of God's work. You're focused on yourself. You're focused on your law keeping. And look, with all due respect, maybe you just need to stop moping over your failure and start taking it to Jesus. And you need to hear God speak this truth over you. You are not condemned. No matter how many times you've done it, you are not condemned. But I feel <laughs> that I should be condemned. Of course you do. It's because you should be condemned. <laughs> we are way worse than we realize, but his love is greater than our sin. Yes, you deserve condemnation, but you will never face condemnation because Jesus has condemned your sin in the flesh through his sacrifice, and God never, ever punishes the same sin twice. It's done. And we need to be careful that we don't tell God that the sacrifice of his son's not enough. The slate is clean. What I feel is not often the basis for understanding what is true, but what God says is always true. Not what I feel in here, because I feel condemned and wretched. Don't let that determine what's true for you. But what is said in here, let that determine the truth. Maybe you often look back at your past with a sense of shame. The things you have done, the effect that it had on others. And there may still be consequences with that that you are dealing with to this very day. But God has seen all of it. And he is still saying to you right now, no, not condemned. You might feel you failed in relationships, you failed in marriages, you failed in parenting, you failed in your friendships, you failed at work, you failed in the church. You might feel, I've just let people down, I've not been good enough. You need to see that in God's eyes, you're not condemned. 
if you're responsible, if you've done the wrong, if you've caused the hurt, you're not condemned. You might feel that sometimes that God is punishing you, that he's not happy with you, that he's disappointed, that he maybe wants nothing to do with you because you keep letting him down all the time. That's a lie. And you counter it with the truth of God's word. Jesus' sacrifice was enough. There is never a day where God can love you any more or a day where he can love you any less. Because you're in Christ. You've got his righteousness. You have everything. You read your Bible that morning? Great. Does that mean God loves you more that day? No. You sin? Well, repent. Does that mean God loves you less that day? No. Every day the verdict's the same. You're not condemned. You're not condemned. My son, my son was condemned for you. You're not condemned. And folks, when you get that, well, that's freedom. This is not religion. Religion where you slavishly try to earn favor that you are unsure you will ever get. No, no, no. This is what we call grace. When you accept a gift given to you out of love that you don't deserve. But that doesn't make us complacent with the sin in our life. And this is what we're going to see more of next week. Actually, knowing that you are free and that no matter what you do, you will never be judged. When you know that, that gives you the power now to fight sin. And that's the second application, actually, of this verse. Keep fighting against sin. If you are condemning yourself with sin, that's wrong. You might say, oh, well, God doesn't condemn me, but I condemn myself. You're not better than God. You don't say that. You listen to what he says. If you're condemning yourself with your own sin, that's wrong. But if you're complacent with your sin, that's also wrong. God set us free from the consequence of our sin, not so that we could be at peace with the sin within us, but so that we could make war with the sin within us. And knowing you are not condemned empowers you to fight. We're not held by sin. We're with God now. His Spirit is with us. That's not who we are. We can live God's way. And that's what I think Paul is saying in, in verse 4. See, in verse 4, he says, you know, Jesus was condemned for our sin in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. Now I think what he's saying there, there's different ways of understanding that, but I think what he's saying there is that the law required a righteous life that we could never do. But now that Jesus has suffered for our sin, we can now live in a way that is righteous and holy. And ultimately loving, because love is the fulfillment of God's law. And that's what God wants for you. As we walk in step God, with God's spirit, we can fight sin. We're going to see this next week. But for now, I want us to see how this verdict of no condemnation helps you to do that. We close with this. What, um, what did we, well, it's not celebrate, but remember on Thursday? I don't know. Well, most of us, Prime Minister didn't. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. D Day. D Day. Why? Why do we sell? We, we, we remember this, the, the men and women who gave their lives in, in these wars. Why do we celebrate D Day? We remember that battle because in World War II, when the Allies invaded the beaches of Normandy to overthrow the Nazis, that was the decisive battle that effectively ended, ended the war. The war. Yep. Once they had done that, it was just inevitable. Nazis were done for. The Allies had won. But even though the victory was assured, the troops still had to march through Europe to Berlin to put an end once and for all. And yet how confident they would have been knowing that in the end, there is victory. Empowers you to fight with confidence. If you're fighting thinking, I don't know where this is going to go or how this is going to end up, that's hard. But if you're fighting thinking, no, the victory's won, it's happening, we are moving forward. 
Folks, we can fight sin because we know in the end it has no say over us. Jesus gets the victory and you will never, ever be condemned. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Let me pray. Father, help us to understand the full weight of what it means to say that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Father, if only, if only we could get that truth deep into our hearts, how we would be set free from condemning guilt and shame of our sin, how, we'd be, how, we'd, how we would be empowered to fight against it, to honour you, to live in a way that you have called us to, Father, so many of our ills and issues come because we're, we're carving in on ourselves. We're looking at ourselves. We're despairing that we feel that we're not doing enough. And Father, set us free from that. We have been set free from the law of sin and death by the Spirit that gives life. And so help us look up and see the finished and complete work of Jesus. He has delivered us from these bodies of sin. He has rescued us from all the wrong that we have done. And Father, would we just marvel and feel the joy of the freedom that only Christ can give us. Help us to do that by your Holy Spirit. In his name, amen. amen. Folks, we're going to sing another new hymn. Um, but before we... Before we do, does anyone have any questions? Amazing, thank you. Yeah. Just to repeat that, the camera, Sabir was saying, we're fighting from victory, not for victory. Yeah, helpful. Helpful. It's good. Yeah, definitely. That's why this chapter matters. So this chapter is meant to be a counter to the doubts that actually Paul himself, I think, faced. No, you're right. If you don't read this, well, you don't remember what he says. You know what I mean? So you're always going to be in the Bible. Right? Yeah. This, I, this contradicts everything that goes on in the message, you know? Yeah, man. You don't mean contradiction, but uh, like my sinful nature tells me to do the things that God tells me the opposite. Like, yeah. You know? Well, your sinful nature, the devil, will tell you one thing constantly, and that is you're condemned. That's what he'll tell you. So that's his number one lie to, to get you away from Christ. Yeah. And you counter that with the truth by saying, okay. I'm not condemned. Yeah. I, I think just the, I really think a helpful spiritual discipline, I know a lot of folks here are new Christians, young Christians, is to try and memorize parts of the Bible. And here's a good starting point. Just memorize Romans 8 verse 1. It's easy. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So you can memorize that. And when those tempting thoughts come, I'm condemned, I'm condemned, I'm not worthy, you can say, yeah, I'm not worthy. But there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's your weapon. Ephesians 6 says that. Yeah, well, that's, Jesus did it against the devil. He used the scripture as his weapon. Ephesians 6 says the, the word, the scripture is the sword of the spirit. It's the offensive against these doubts. And tell yourself, tell the devil, tell your flesh, I'm not condemned. Not condemned. Because he says I'm not condemned. And he's more powerful than me, the devil, or anyone. His verdict stands. Good. He felt the battle, man. Yeah, that, that's why Hebrews 4 would say that's why he's the best counselor. Because he's been in the war, but he's been victorious. He's resisted and he's not succumbed like we have. He's succeeded where we've all failed. And that's why, and we're going to see this next week, not only are you not condemned, but you have a great resource in the struggle. God himself is with you and he will help um, as we walk in step with his spirit. We're going to sing another, like I said, Romans 8 has inspired many songs. We're going to sing a newer song. The song is called God is for us. And it's based upon Romans 8, 31 to 39. It's just one of the most unbelievable bits of the whole chapter. Um, so uh, let's stand and we'll sing this song. And please remain standing for the closing prayer. Find a rest. 
strong and mighty fortress raise your voice now no love is greater who can stand against us if our god is for us even when i stumble even when i fall even when i turn back still your love is sure you will not abandon you will not forsake you will cheer me onward with an ending grace sing with joy now our god is for us the father's love is a strong and mighty fortress raise your voice now no love is greater who can stand against us if our god is for us we close now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God our Savior be glory majesty power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore amen amen, amen. amen. please do have a seat and someone will serve you Billy will serve you tea and coffee